Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames are slowly starting to race back towards the wild card. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, this was this was a fun week for Flames fans. And it, it's been a while since we've been able to say that. Yeah, um, still not quite good enough in my opinion. But, you know, it's definitely a big step in the right direction. Two wins, and they get at least a point in every game. So definitely a step in the right direction, and some big wins, too, which is always fun as a Flames fan. Oh, definitely. Well, let's talk about the first big win of the week. The Calgary Flames uh, took on the Ottawa Senators, and there's a team that the Flames have traditionally not done well against. You and I both weren't sure what to make of this one. Big Flames win, 5-1 over the Senators, getting goals from Anderson, Lindholm, Huberto, Hannafin, and Lewis. There's a name we don't talk about too often anymore, Trevor Lewis. Um, this was, I mean, when I see a game like this, Ottawa's not the bad team they've been in the past. And when I saw this 5-1 win, I thought to myself, you know what, this Flames team can do it when they want to. How would you say, like, it, we saw this week, uh, throughout the week, where, like, flashes of the team that, like, you and I both thought they were at the beginning of the year, where, like, they will be the best team in the West, and, and, and. And, like, in this game, they showed a lot of flashes of that, where, um, you know, like, they pretty much just kicked Ottawa, you know, to the curb in this one, and, you know, like, they... Ottawa had nothing, frankly. Like it, even the one goal that they did get um, was not a particularly good goal. It was a silly giveaway by Backlund and Markstrom that just happened to go on the wrong stick, and it should have been an easy shutout win for the Flames. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, but it was in basically everything but name only. Now, granted, Ottawa didn't have the best goaltender in that. That's probably part of it. But even then, outside of even just the scoring, I thought the Flames looked good in all three zones here. Yeah, and to be fair to Ottawa, they the night before, they were in a different city, and then they had, like, a flight delay until, like, 4 in the morning. Um, so, like, everybody was dead, dead tired, and they looked it uh, during the game, and Calgary kind of got away with, um, frankly, facing a team that wasn't on their game due to just you know the human element of being fatigued due to weird for sure uh, and to be fair conditions. i don't think the flames were at 100 percent either i think it was sort of a perfect storm of all those things like you said to win they look good but i would say that they there could have been a lot better play from the flames here yeah um anything else with the ottawa game that's pretty no, much it for me uh, yeah uh it was just a good performance they got the two points they needed and on to the next. And that was a good way to start off the week. Yeah. Especially sure. after the 3 to 1 loss to Anaheim. Yeah, well, like at, at the end of our last episode, like I said that the Flames really needed to have 7 out of 8 points in order to be realistically in this still and they did fall a little bit short. They got 6. But, but uh you know, getting two right off the hop was the best foot forward that they could get. And then the Calgary Flames went on a, a little bit of a road trip. They went to Mullet Arena and ended up losing 4-3 to three to Arizona in overtime here. Um, Huberto tied it late for the Flames, but they couldn't get it done, and the Flames only walk away with one point. Yeah, this was a game where Calgary, frankly, took Arizona a little lightly. I agree. Um, and... That wasn't to say that Arizona was uh, bad per se, but like they're, you can tell just from their lineup that like they've got like four guys that know how to be like effective NHLers, and then a bunch of guys learning on the job. And you know, Calgary um, took the you know you look at the names and you you think that should be an easy two points, and they took them a little lightly. And Arizona's like, well, we're just going to skate hard and see what happens. And Calgary got a little sloppy at times. And, you know, Markstrom played well despite giving up four goals. But, you know, it, it again, it, one of those where, just like the Anaheim game last week, where you need the points and you're coughing up one to a really bad team. Granted, they got one, which is great. So, you know, I'm all all for overtime losses. If you're going to 
lose a game, get a point. Yeah, but, if you're, gonna, you're right. If you're going to lose, you might as well get get credit for it. Yeah, but um, yeah, not ideal. Good to see Walker Dewar on the scoreboard. I mean, he's turned into a, a good NHLer. But I agree with your assessment that I think the Flames took this team a little lightly. I didn't like the Flames' overall play in this game. I thought that the best flame was probably Jacob Markstrom. Yeah, I, I agree. He was the only one that was consistently dynamite in this game. And then the Calgary Flames on Thursday went to the arena they hadn't won at yet, T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, and finally broke that streak. So we've now won at the Honda Center and won at T-Mobile Arena. A big win for the Flames, a 7-2 victory over yeah. the Golden oh, yeah. Knights wearing their ugly mustard gold jerseys. Yeah, the the morning of that game, I joked that uh, to somebody that, you know, the Flames, it's a must-win game. They're going up against a tough team. Uh, they've never won before in that building. So it's like, let's stack everything against them for this year's iteration of the Flames. I said, you know, what they'll likely end up do is winning 8-2 to two or something stupid like that. I was one off it, with my pedantic joke i did not anticipate that performance and boy did they turn it on in the third period yeah and i mean this is this is not a bad team i mean the las vegas golden knights are you know one of the literally, I, literally the best in the west yeah i was gonna say one of the best teams in the west i would say on the scoreboard for sure best in the west um but yeah this was i think really what the flames needed at this point especially after that one point in Arizona to really reset themselves and get going. And I was, I was not expecting this. Like even when, you know, the flames got the early Uyghur to Foley goal. Then we saw uh, Vegas get two white cloud and Smith scored. I really thought at that point, the flames were going to start to struggle. Yeah. And you know, they showed some resilience and some backbone. They got regained the lead almost immediately after the tying goal. And you know, like when Vegas tied it, I'm like, oh, well, we're going to slide into a loss again. Or, you know, it's the usual refrain. But for really the first time this season, the team actually followed through and stood up. And, you know, like they just ran over Vegas like they weren't even there in the, the third period. And, you know, it, it was a masterful masterful performance by the team and everybody top of the lineup down um it, heading into this game daryl sutter shifted the line significantly and boy did they work well um uh, manjapane with uh lynn tolman to foley ended up i think combining for four goals in the game uh huberdo's line with Backlund and coleman registered a couple so you know it, it, a good effort by everybody involved in uh, yeah, uh, it was just uh, uh, exactly what the doctor ordered for this team. I'm glad you mentioned the line shakeups there. There was a lot made of the fact that the Flames shook up some lines here. Um, the fact that we saw Rajichka back in, he hasn't been in a while. And also, uh, Jacob Pelty and Walker Dewar both sitting out, which a lot of fans were quite upset by. Well, how would you say, with young guys like Dewar and Pelty, um Usually they come in hot a bit and then they cool down and then as the league like adjusts to how they play and it requires the guys to reset themselves to take that next step to readjust to the league adjusting to them. And so uh, them sitting Peltier and Dewar in this one made perfect sense to me um, just because look, Peltier has been kind of off for the last handful of games and it's frustrating because, you know, like everybody cheers for Peltier because, hey, he's doing really good this season for this team. But, uh, you know, he's struggled quite a bit over the last little bit, and it was the right decision to pull him. I agree. And I think also trying to get some of the veterans going here. Yeah. Well, in addition to, you know, it's one of those where, you know, just because the guy is sitting doesn't mean that. You know, like, he's not learning on the job. You know, like, uh, last year, uh, later in the season, uh, the Flames sat, sat uh, Dylan Dubé for a couple of games. And then, like, he was on fire after that because he was learning, like, because Daryl had pointed out certain things to look for 
and he adjusted his game. And I, you know, I'm sure that uh, the Flames had a checklist of things for Peltier to evaluate while being upstairs. And, you know, same with Dewar. And, you know, it, it's one of those that they need, you know, in order to take that next step to become that premier top six forward for each of them, that they need to be able to learn and incorporate new strategies into their game uh, just to take them to the, those next levels. Yeah, and uh, I don't have the text of it in front of me, um, but I'd encourage fans to look up the interview with Rasmus Anderson the next morning who talked about when he was a young player, he got sat for a couple games and just the benefit it gave him to be able to watch from the press box and sort of analyze things like you were saying in a bit of a different way. And he was he said that really helped him. So I didn't have anything to worry about here. I don't think that that's had as much impact as some people thought it would. I think, again, we, we've talked about this in the show. People like to see the, the rookies, the young guys. And I think that this is just part of a young guy's progression. You know, you, you're going to play some, you're not going to play some. Um, you you got to be ready for that, especially when you're a mid-season acquisition to a team. Yeah, and, you know, with that, um, it will just benefit them over the long term, like, in terms of, like, next season and beyond, as, you know, like, if the Flames do have to make alterations to the team, that they'll be requiring guys like Peltier and Dewar to take more prominent roles in the organization to sort of like backfill uh, like what Manjapane and Dubé were to the team like last year and beyond uh, back and, you know, sort of take those spots at, while Manjapane and Dubé take more prominent roles themselves and, you know, kind of up the lineup into the top six. And, you know, it it's very important uh, for this team moving forward. And hopefully uh, they are getting tutelage uh, and learning from sitting only a few players in this game did not have points for the flames lucic lewis richie rujicka kadri and tanev and stetcher did not yeah and you know uh, just to mention with the nazim kadri because you brought him up there um he's ever since that game against the new york rangers where he got hit by Truba, uh, he has not really played the same, and hopefully, um, you know, like as the weeks um, come closer to the end of the season, uh, that he can bounce back from whatever it has been affecting him since then. Um, and for sure, you know, let's come back to him when we talk a little bit about line changes because I, yeah. I got some thoughts there too. Mm-hmm. Um, the last game of the season, the Calgary Flames back home to take on the Dallas Stars. These are teams that don't usually score many goals against each other. And I think they probably scored more in this one game than they have against each other for entire seasons in the past. A 6-5 win from the Stars in overtime. So Flames well, the thing is, uh, in this one, uh, like last year in the playoff series, I think in the seven games there was only 28 goals scored between the two teams. Yeah, and in the three games in the season series, there was 31. So, yeah, a little bit of a different feel between <laughs> these two teams this year. I mean, we had 11 in this game alone. Yeah, not exactly uh, how Daryl would have drawn it up, and you know, it's unfortunate that they lost in overtime once again. But when you're down three to one after one period of play, and then to come back the way that they did with such authority as frustrating it is it is that they lost this game um they are also playing one of the very elite teams in the west and they were able to like completely dominate them for good like 20 minutes straight you know it just some bad luck and some bad defense by the team uh in a, in a number of the stars goals like the first one and uh well Pretty much any of the rebound goals that they got were just, you know, you just have to shake your head because it's like there's only so much Markstrom can do on the first, the second, and the third shots. You know, you need somebody to help. And you mentioned how the point. Flames fell down here, and I think that's an important story of this game. Like, after the first period, it was 3-1 Dallas. And these Calgary Flames teams that we're seeing over the last couple of years normally would have just fallen apart at that point. But we saw... Um, McKenzie 
Uyghur come out in the second and score a goal. We saw, uh, you know, Blake Coleman, Nick Ritchie get it back. And this team didn't seem to quit. Like this team just kept going and kept pushing. And, and I think that's really important for Flames fans to remember is this, you know, we, we saw a very different team here and we saw a team that looked a lot more resilient. So even in the loss, there's good things to take away from this game. Oh, for sure. And, you know, this is the only reason why, um, like normally, like because they came short of my hope for you know seven out of the eight points. That you know, the manner in which they played that game and the fact that they were able to control the play for so long, and yeah, ultimately it didn't work out for them. But that was more that they've shown all year. And if they were playing somebody other than Dallas, they win that game in regulation, and. You know, like credit to Dallas for being very good, but you know, like that was something that we've been needing from this team for months, and you know, it's the right time for them to be on this train now for sure. And then, even after the Richie goal, I mean, Calgary somehow managed to make it four to three. Then, not too long later, Jason Robertson scores tie it up, and again, you think the Flames would maybe deflate, but. Um, Anderson went out there and he got the five, four goal, uh, hack and paw got the five, five goal and they kept going. I'd say maybe a little bit of coverage blown in the Robertson goal on in overtime. But other than that, you can't complain about the flames game here. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that if the flames are in a situation where they have an offensive zone, uh, face off, uh, with less than 30 seconds in overtime, to just play defense the the rest of the thing and get it to a shootout because I think that's like the third or fourth time that they've given up a goal in the last 30 seconds due to carelessness like that. And it, it's just frustrating because it's like, oh, I've seen this play before. You're just coughing up points left, right, and center for no reason. Which they might have lost in the shootout too, but it, you know, it just the lack of awareness defensively. It, in the last like 30 seconds, you know, it's just tough losing points for no, no real reason. So if we take a look now at the wild card race for the Western conference, um, Seattle has wild card spot one. They have 83 points with 69 games played. Winnipeg has wild card spot two. They have 70 games played and 81 points. The Calgary flames right on their um, heels. Just to, uh, just to stop you there. Um, in the middle of our recording, the jets have, uh, uh, like it's like two minutes left in their game and they're down three nothing. Um, so likely it's going to be uh, 71 games played. Uh, there you go. With so, the, so the Flames same. have one game on hand in hand then. Yeah. And the Calgary Flames 70 games played with 77 points. The Flames now 31 wins, 20, 24 losses, and 15 overtime losses. And we've got Nashville breathing right down our neck. They have 67 games, so they have. Um, they just lost to seven nothing. Did they? So, okay. Yeah. Who are they so, playing? The New York Rangers. Okay. So it's 68 now. So 68 games and uh, 76 points still, but I mean they're they're right there as well. So the Flames have to continue winning because if not, Nashville's easily going to pass them by. Yeah, and then, you know it's like okay, good, you got six out of eight points this week. Cool. Uh, that that's great. You're still alive. At this point, you're still out of a playoff spot. So. I think at this point, they've really got to be looking for, and I know you can't do it, but I think you've really got to be looking for at least a point a game. Yeah, and, you know, like uh, this upcoming week, the Flames have two more tough games with L.A. and Vegas. So very much like this week where, uh, you know, they had some challenging opponents, and I'm sure Vegas is going to be, uh, champing at the bit to have some payback after last week, you know, their 7 2 loss on the 16th. So, but you know, you're mentioning the Vegas game again. What I like from the Flames this week, though, is they took on two of the best teams in the West and they held their own against both. They got three out of four. They did. You know, you, you know Dallas, they held their own against, even though they didn't win. They, I thought they played a good game against them. Vegas, they won handedly. So for all the challenges the Flames have had, and I've asked a lot of times, could they win seven in the playoffs? When I start to see games like that, 
or sorry, could they win four out of seven in the playoffs? When I see games like that, I start to think maybe they could. And that's the been the frustrating part of this team this season is that you know, like you take the Dallas game, like they had four posts where like if they just had slightly better luck, they win that in regulation. And because like they were all inside the post, <laughs> you know, and just bad luck. And you know, like Calgary played well enough with the the two best teams in the West, and took three out of four. And you know, if Calgary can figure out a way to get into the playoffs, like they're going to be the eighth seed more than likely, or the seventh seed. Uh, I don't see them getting past anybody else. But um, you know, so like they're going to be playing a Dallas or a Vegas in round one, and. The, the Flames won't have any pressure on them because, you know, they're the bad team. <laughs> you know, just like Dallas last year was not supposed to really do anything against us. And yet, you know, it took, uh, you know, 66 shots, I think it was, on Ottinger last uh, year in Game 7 to finally put them away. And, you know, it, it's one of those where you just have to get in and if this team can start to show um, that ability to just roll over teams like that heading into the playoffs, if they can get there, like the flames instantly become one of the most dangerous teams in the West. It's just that they have to get through the last 12 games and make up the five points that they'll need. Cause they don't have the tiebreaker on Winnipeg or Nashville or anybody else because of all the overtime losses. <laughs> I'm just looking at the schedules here. There's no way they get in anywhere past the last spot. They could conceivably catch Seattle if they fall on their face, which, you know, it, it's possible. Based on Seattle's record so far, though, that's yeah. not likely to happen. And as we're recording this, uh, Winnipeg just got shut out. So, yay. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think overall, a lot to build on this week, a lot for the Sea of Red to be happy about. And I think the big question is going to be, will they be able to build on this coming up? Like you said, they have four games this coming week, two of which are going to be, I think, challenge, challenging games for them. And I think the big challenge, based on what we've seen from the Flames, consistency, playing like it's an important game when you're playing bad teams. They've got Anaheim, they've got... Uh, the Ducks, or sorry, the, they've got the Anaheim Ducks and they've got the uh, San Jose Sharks. I think they're going to have to play like those games are against playoff teams. Yeah, and then, you know, like you're looking at, you know, heading into April where, you know, most of the games are against teams that are already out, like Anaheim, Chicago, Vancouver, San Jose, and then the two teams that were in the dog hunt uh, with, with Winnipeg and Nashville. So... You know, it, it's going to be tough, you know, like this. And these guys don't play well against bad teams this year. No. And like the one good thing is that uh, Nashville with their schedule, even though they have games in hand, that like almost every one of their games is against like the best teams in the NHL. So they're going to have, you know, they could conceivably move into a playoff spot, but you know, they're going to have to beat like all the good teams in order to do so. And I don't really see that as they got thumped today, seven zip. Um, so like they're kind of a quasi they're there, but they're not in my books. Um, and it's really Winnipeg and, uh, the jets only have a handful of easy games today was actually supposed to be one of them, uh, but they got shut out. So, you know, Calgary, if they win against L.A., then same games played, they're only two points back, and then it's a jump ball. And, you know, it's they just have to go out, you know, each game and just try their best. And if they can muster a streak, that would be just exactly what they need. Well... Let's uh, let's focus a little bit on the new lines, which I think we're going to see very similar lines, if not the same, at least for the first game this week, because they seem to be working for the Flames. We've seen some changes to the lineup for the Flames. Um, let's I'll go through them all, and then we can break them down line by line. Yep. The first line now is Andrew Mangiapane on the left, 
with Lindholm at center and Defoley on the right. The second line is Jonathan Huberto with Michael Backlund at center and Blake Coleman on the right. Third line is Dylan Dubé on the left with Nazim Kadri at center and Walker Dewar on the right. And the last line has been Richie on the left with Rajichka and Lewis. So, Matt, overall, when we look at the first line, Andrew Maggiapani getting promoted here. We've seen Dylan Dubé playing top line minutes for a while. This has to be their way of trying to get Mangiapane going because they're putting him up there with two of their best. Well, the the thing with uh, Mangiapane is that he's been generating a lot of really high dangerous scoring chances, and like even in the Dallas game, there were a couple where he was like right in front and took shots that the goalie got a glove on or a blocker on, and you know doing all the right things. It's just that uh, you know. Like, he's hit the post repeatedly. The goalies have made great saves on him. Like, he's doing all the right things. It's just that, for whatever reason, the luck is not on his side this year. Um, and getting him with good line mates makes sense. And, you know, he's been a very good foil for the other two uh, since they've been reunited. Because um, I do believe this line was together earlier in the season. But um, I think so, yeah. Y- you know, and... If it continues to work and the other guys are getting, you know, because how would you say with Lindholm and Toffoli, they both need guys that can pass the puck very well. And Manjapani is a very good puck distributor in his own right. So even if he's not necessarily being able to score the goals himself, he's definitely a good foil for the other two. For sure. I I like on paper the look of that line. Again, I don't think that... Manjapani's had a great year, but I like the look of that line. I like that it splits up uh, some of our best players and brings Huberto to the second line. Very interesting second line. You've got Jonathan Huberto on the left, who's obviously looking at being the driver on that line. Michael Backlund gets promoted to second line center, being your defensive centerman there. And Blake Coleman on the right, again, trying to get Coleman going. Um, but I think you've really got on that line a little bit of everything. You've got your two-way center in Backland. You've got your passer with Coleman and a guy who can make the plays and obviously Huberto who's supposed to be hitting at home. You know, like, it, it's not ideal having Huberto playing with Backland and Coleman um, based off of, like, last year and before's version of Huberto. But, um, like, Huberto's been doing very well this year playing defensively. And so having him on a line with those two who are very effective shutdown players and very good at generating offense in their own right. It's not the traditional matchup of guys that he would normally be with, but it's been very effective uh, through the two games thus far. So we've seen a number of lines that Backlund's been on over the years that have been, I would say better than the sum of their parts. Yeah. And Huberto, I think that why he's struggled so much this year is that, frankly, playing with the Panthers, what's defense? Um, You know, and learning how uh, to play that effective two-way game. And, you know, it's tough being asked to do everything. And especially coming into a new organization. And, you know, Gaudreau, when he first played with Daryl, like, he was not very good. Uh, for the first year, but then the second year, he he and Kachuk and uh, Lindholm had figured it all out, and were able to transition the good defense, creating the offense, and and with him being on the line with Backlund and Coleman, who are both extremely good defensively, it's helping Huberto be able to create offense as well because of that. I think you're right. It's not my ideal second line, but. With where the team is right now, I'm okay with them giving it a shot. Yeah. And then the third line, you've got Kadri, who you mentioned earlier, hasn't been looking like himself lately. He's been prom- he's been demoted to the third line, playing with Walker Dewar and Dylan Dubé. I think that's a good promotion for Walker Dewar to be on a line with those two. He's looked like a guy who deserved to get off the fourth line. Um, Dylan Dubé, I still don't know what to make of him. This just feels like kind of the leftover guys. Well, it, it's a bit of a fun line uh, because you look at all three of them and they're all very quick forwards that play edge a little with a little bit of edge, uh, get in on the forecheck and are chippy and annoying. 
which if they can get some chemistry going and if the Flames make the postseason, like that could be a really annoying, annoying line for other teams to play against. Um, so if that can work, that would be amazing for this team. And, you know, we'll see. Yeah, and, and I think you could see more of... I think you could see more from this line than you expect to. I, I think, like you said, Kadri hasn't looked like himself lately. But I think that if you... To me, I look at this as as Dubé being the offensive driver on this line. Mm -hmm. And I think you're looking for a little bit of a different type of play from Kadri here. I think you're looking for Kadri to be your heavier, muckier forward on this line. Yeah, I agree. And same with Dewar, um, just being the little speedster that he is and getting into all the right spots to interrupt the flow. And then the fourth line here is Nick Ritchie playing with Adam Rajichka and Trevor Lewis. So we're seeing... Uh, Lucic out of the lineup. What do you think of that fourth line? Uh, the only change I'd like to see is Lewis be at center and uh, Pelte in on that line. Um, no offense to Rujitska, but uh, he has not played effectively for months. No, he looked um, really good at the beginning of the year. And yeah, then he. Uh, like there's no consistency in his game and like he just looks a little bit lost at times and you know not playing i think has hurt him but you know you kind of also can't put him through waivers because he would get claimed so it's kind of a damned if you do damned if you don't with him and hopefully like this offseason he can learn how to be more consistent on a nightly basis uh to get a full-time job and but for moving forward, like uh, having Lewis with Pelte and uh, Richie, I think would be a fairly effective pest line uh, with the, all three of the forwards being quick enough and with enough offensive talent to capitalize. I like capitalize. what we've seen from Richie so far. Yeah, same here. Um, the right amount of jam and chippiness that you need. And, you know, he needs to be that little bit of a disturber. And... Peltier has that disturber essence to him, and Lewis is just the professional fourth line center. So, um, you know, like that line could, again, like if the Flames do make it to the postseason, like that could be a really pain in the ass line to play against. And, you know, like the Flames could, with that trio, uh, roll four lines effectively and then start to really get momentum because the bottom two lines are filled with nothing but speedsters that are also got some jam to them and that's what this team needs trying to balance these bottom two lines out a little bit i think if it was me i would probably move i do one of two things I'd either put walker doer on the fourth line with richie and lewis because i think that doer and richie could be an interesting pair the two of them um or i would move dylan dubay to center of the fourth line and then put peltier on his spot with cadre doer yeah I, and I could see that. And as I think well. that might actually be the better thing to do than go Lewis at center is move Dubé to to four C. And we could definitely see that too. Um, that's one of the good things about having interchangeable parts is that you know you have a bunch of different guys that can do the jobs effectively, and that's the important thing. And I'm just grateful that Lucic isn't playing because, frankly, like. It, over the last like month and a half, two months, like he's consistently been the worst player on the team. And yeah, you know, like uh, the, this team simply needs more from that role. And Richie can do most of the same things uh, on the physical side, but he can also keep up and drive plays too. And we mentioned Nazem Kadri and him sort of cooling off a little bit here um, and potentially that being you know, him since he got hit in the New York game, I really have to hope this is temporary. I mean, we're paying him enough money. This better be temporary. Yeah, hopefully. Um, you know, to me, it looked like he got a concussion at the time, but uh, yet stayed in the game and has played every game since. But, he, like, his just he just does not seem to be quite himself on the ice no and and he's 30 i mean he's 32 he's at the age where he's going to start slowing down and maybe that concussion has more effect on him than we thought because of that but i was hoping to at least get a couple full years out of him yeah because we have him on contract for seven years well 
and hopefully that, uh, you know, it, it's just a temporary thing. And Hopefully. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think he's probably playing through it, trying to get the team to the playoffs. If they were out, I have a feeling he'd probably be sitting or uh, getting some treatment right now. Yeah. But I think being the trooper he is, he's trying to fight through it. Well, Matt, let's uh, go from talking about Lucic, who's maybe the worst flame on the team, talking about a guy who's really having a career year, and that's Tyler Toffoli having the best year of his career. Before this year, his best year is 15-16 at uh, 58 points with L.A. This year, he's quietly become, I'd say, one of, if not the top flames on this team, and it, he's now sitting at 61 points. Yeah, and, you know, the, with losing Kachuk and... Uh... Gaudreau this offseason we needed somebody to step up and you know what I think we both naturally thought that Huberto and Kadri would fill most of that but um I thought Huberto I thought Kadri I thought that uh, Mangiapane would step up but you know credit to Tyler Toffoli and you know he's been everything that we've needed him to be and you know frankly this is a player that I would not mind if the Flames kept for a long time um you know, he's still young-ish and, you know, could be a very serviceable top nine forward for this team for a number of years. Tyler Toffoli is 30 this year, so yeah, I think you could get four or five more years out of him if he wants to stay here. He's now the top-scoring flame this year. He has 61 points. Behind him is Lindholm at 59 and Kadri at 49. When the Flames brought him in last year on a hockey deal at the deadline, I, I think we all kind of saw him being that number two winger. And I still think he would have been if Johnny and Matthew were here. And he's a guy who I don't know other GMs would have looked at him as being their top right wing. And I'm not sure that's where you want him on this team, but he's he's jumped into that role very well right now. Yeah. He's like, okay, fine. It's mine. I'm taking it. It's mine. You're not taking and I think it. <laughs> we're, and I think even from last year, he played 37 games of flame last year and got 23 points. There's times last year when I didn't really know what he was or who he was. And he just kind of seemed like a generic player out there. And this year, I'd say we're really seeing who Toffoli is and his identity. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why, like, every team that he's left, everybody's like, oh, that's disappointing. Because he, you know, he's been a very quality forward for all the teams that he's played for. And, you know, it was lacking last year after we got him, uh, especially in the playoffs where he kind of struggled quite a bit. But, uh, you know, he has elevated his game and, you know, it makes entire sense he's having a career year. He's been awesome for this team. I'm hoping he's a guy they will lock up to a three or four year deal in the summer because I agree with you. I think he needs to stay aflame for a while. Mm -hmm. It's funny. You can start to see who the fans think should be aflame by how many of their jerseys are seen in the, in the dome? And I've yet to see more than one seventy-three jersey. Yeah, but I think if he signs long term, he will. But it's still it's it's weird to see his number. Like it's just it's not a a, a hockey number. Yeah, well, especially like after having Berkey in the team for so long that uh, one to thirty, that was it. Yeah, it's like uh, what's this numbers go past thirty five? What? Huh? What? I remember you and I went to a, a, a Q and A session. Somebody asked Berkey at the time. So we've just drafted this uh, Bennett kid. He's going to want to wear ninety three. What are you doing? They said, Ah, I guess he can probably wear like thirty nine or twenty nine or something like that. And I always thought that was a dumb rule. I think we see it with Lou too. It's like if the guy wants to wear seventy three and he's superstitious, let the man wear seventy three. Why do you care? Yeah, I know. Well, it, you know, I do have to say it is a little weird to have uh, two defensemen wearing number fifty one and fifty two. That's true. Well, and and I mean, one of them, okay, Stetcher. I don't know what's behind the fifty one. I I know he's worn it before, but I have to think it was one of those numbers you got assigned and then never changed it. I mean, we could have three defensemen in the fifties if uh, if Schilling was here. We'd also have fifty eight. Well, Hannafin too. So. Yeah, could have four. Yeah, but I mean, 55 is kind of defenseman number. Mm -hmm. True. But if you look at Stetcher, he's worn 51, 70, and I just don't think he cares. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Uyghur came in here and wanted 52. Yeah. So yeah, it, it is weird. We're getting some interesting hockey numbers this year. Yep. 
Another flame I wanted to talk to you about, and a guy that I've been hard on in the past more because of his salary than anything, is Michael Backlund. And I think we're seeing Backlund really emerging this year. He's 34, and I'd say playing some of the the best hockey that we've seen from him in a while. Matt, this is a flame that, I mean, he's got 46 points this year, which I think is, uh, he's had two 47-point years, so this is on pace to be a, a career year for him. This is a flame that I could see them going out and locking up this summer long-term. He's got one more year after this, but I could see them trying to do a long-term deal and then giving this guy the C. Yeah, it's one of those where, you know, with any player, it's well, how hard is it to replace that guy? And, you know, and the, the projection ability of his role on the team. And, like... Okay, if you sign Backlund, say, to a four-year deal that carries him through till he's 39, you know, he's going to still be an effective defensive player. Like, his offense might dry up to the point where, like, he's getting 20 points on the, the fourth line. But, you know, like, he reminds me a lot of Yuri Lettinen of the Dallas Stars, who played, you know, very effectively for his entire career with Dallas. And, um... He is just one of those guys that he does everything that you want defensively, and the offense is just a bonus, and he also happens to be decent offensively. And, you know, it, I could definitely see him sticking and just being that, you know, ultra-reliable defensive guy that helps to teach everybody else how to play. And, yeah. You know, yeah, and I think there's a lot that he does that we don't see behind the scenes. And I think some of his value is what we're not seeing um, in the dressing room, in the community, what he brings to this team. I think there's there's a lot there that maybe we're undervaluing. Yeah. Well, put it this way, of the three forwards that are free agents after next season between Lindholm to Foley and Backlund, well, the one that I would be most disappointed to see leave would actually be Backlund. I can see that. I think he's the one that would be the hardest to replace. Mm-hmm. Because, like, realistically, same. like, you know, as much as it's, you know, not to slag either of the other guys, but replacing offense with, with you know, a free agent is not as hard as replacing a high-quality defensive forward. And, like, those guys, like, nobody who has a, an extremely talented defensive player ever won't, trades them. Like, well, we've seen Boston hoard <laughs> all of the guys that are on their team for... How many years like Bergeron's still there from like 2003 so you know like it, it's one of those where you know you if you find one that's like that you just keep that guy and you know whatever you need money whatever here take it good <laughs> yeah yeah like I said I'm I think it's probably highest earning years are behind him and I think you can get this guy to take a hometown discount to stay here for the rest of his career but I think that if he resigns here, this is the guy you put the C on, and he's the guy that I think becomes your sort of old grizzled veteran wearing your C. Yeah, and like I could see a four four deal for him. Uh, you know, it, yeah, yeah, I might could suck see f- on the the last year of it, but you know, like Lucci, yeah. we've been able to eat that without it really impacting the team too much. I think you can see four four average. I can't see him giving him four in real money, but yeah, I can see four average. Yeah. Um, and even by then, I'm not sure that this is a player that plays till he's 39. Yeah. So even if we do a four-year deal, you might get two or three out of it. Yeah, and we'll see uh, with him entirely. But, you know, it, it's one of those that it's better to keep that guy. Yeah, he's a guy I would like to retire as a flame. I agree. I know I've been hard on him in the past, and a lot of times I think he's an expensive guy for where he's in the lineup, but then he always shows me that he can do so much more than where he's playing. Yeah. He's like the super uh, utility guy that just does everything that you ask of him. and He is. And he's the guy that sometimes you forget is on the team because his ways of contributing aren't always going to show up on the scoreboard. He's not your big offensive forward. He's not your big playmaker. But, you know, he's a guy that goes out there every every shift and I think gives you, 100%, leaves you a better yeah. place than where you were. Well, it's very much like Mark Giordano. Um, it, as the forward version of that, where he just genuinely does all the things that you could ask of him effectively and puts it all out there. You know, 
if he had you know higher end skill he would be a superstar but you know um he doesn't have that higher end offensive skill so, so he is literally found the way to stick around well he literally should win the, the sulky trophy for best offensive forward this year and um it's one of those where like he's been right in that conversation for at least the last five years and you know it a credit to him like he's very good all, all the time he is for sure well, one last note here to make before we get to our predictions episode maybe one of the most intriguing if not the most intriguing Flames prospect not in the NHL right now or the American League is Matthew Coronado and his team Harvard will be off to the NCAA championships. So for fans that were hoping to see him, uh, they didn't win their EC, whatever, ECC championships um, this weekend. But for fans that were hoping he would join either the Flames or the Wranglers, it looks like you're going to have to wait a little bit longer for that. Yeah, the NCAA is a little weird with how their playoffs Frozen Four thing is structured, where it's not a play-in it's very much an invitational with a few exceptions. So, um, yeah, it's one of those where uh, the last of the season is uh, with the Flames having two games remaining. Um, so, like, that's the latest Harvard could go is that far. So expect him to play in the last two games or last game, sort of like a draw did in that one year. And... Yeah, uh, probably join the Wranglers after that. And I think that playing championship hockey at pretty much any level is good for a player's development. I would rather that he stays in Harvard and plays through the championship and then try to sign him before that or get him out of there early. I think that you need to learn the mental side of preparing for and working your way through the playoffs. Yeah, and like him joining the AHL for their playoff run it would be a huge boon to the Wranglers as well. It would be, well. yeah, for sure. And, you know, I was actually looking today. There's a bunch of other Flames prospects in the Canadian uh, Junior Leagues, and all of them seem to be playoff bound. So the the Wranglers may not have as much help as they have in other years by being able to sign a bunch of amateur tryout agreements. So having, you know, a big player like like Coronado, I think would be good and get him that pro level experience, jump right into the playoffs and see what he can do with it. And we don't need him to be a big player. I mean, he can be your third, fourth line guy at that point for the Wranglers. Oh, yeah. You, you just want him to jump in and learn. And, you know, any con- contributions you can, great. If not, who cares? And if he doesn't play all the games, even like it's not a big deal. It's more for sure. Getting- yeah. Even if he's just around the team. Yeah anything to get him some experience on what it's like to be in those roles. Well, Matt, I think that brings us to the end of this week. Let's look ahead to the week that's coming up for the Calgary flames. The flames, uh, have a back to back Monday, Tuesday. These are late games Monday night. They will be in LA to take on the Kings for an eight 30 PM start time Tuesday. They're taking on the Anaheim ducks an eight PM start time in Anaheim. Then they play the, it's funny, we, we play uh, Vegas again exactly a week from when we played them last time, but in opposite arenas. The Flames come home on Thursday to play Vegas here in Calgary, 7 o'clock start time. And then we're so used to late games on a Saturday. This one's weird. San Jose Sharks Saturday. Not our usual 8 p.m. Hockey Night in Canada start, but a 2 p.m. start against the Sharks. Yeah, um, with Winnipeg losing today, the Flames have 12 games remaining to the Jets' 11. Um, so it's important to make up ground wherever possible and having the game in hand will come in handy this week. And, you know, I said last week for them to have, you thought they'd win all four. Well, they, they needed to win seven out of eight or get seven out of eight points. They ended up getting six, which close enough. And realistically this week, they need to shoot for seven out of eight or eight out of eight again, um, just to try and catch up uh, frankly like so which one or ones do you think they lose then uh the vegas game has me the most worried out of the four but they could drop technically any of them uh but uh, that would be the one that i would wouldn't be surprised if they if the knights uh gave so some you, payback are you predicting wins in the other ones yep 
So you think they beat LA, they beat Anaheim, and they beat San Jose, and they lose to Vegas. Oh, uh, I'm going to predict they run the table, but that's the one that I think will be the tough one. Okay. So you're going with the win in all four again. Yep. Well, they need it. And until they're they're they've got the X by their name saying they're in the playoffs, like they got to give it their all. And you know, they need this as many just, points as possible. There's just a gripe I'm uh, putting down as I'm writing out the uh the initials here for our winners and losers. Vegas the only team I think that has their team name in their initials. Like VGK is their official NHL attribute not like veg which you'd expect yeah well la has lak as well so yeah but usually when i see them like on tv they just abbreviate to la True. same thing with san jose they just abbreviate to sj true yeah that is a little odd and annoying you know like there's no we're not like you know C cgf or you know anything like that every other team even the two letter ones um yeah you know well, even then, like, like, they should, like, have it LV or something like that. Well, but they're not the Las Vegas Golden Knights. They're Vegas Golden Knights, so I just go V-E-G. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, looks- I guess they didn't want to be thought of as vegetables, so they went with VG. <laughs> I don't know. That could be. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what was the um, the Vegas airport code, but that wouldn't matter. But, yeah, it's just it's weird when I look at it. Um, I'm... And do you think Markstrom's playing every game? Uh, I think you ride him until you, you know, you're back in the playoff spot. So, uh, I, you know, realistically, he should get a start. Or Vladar should get a start somewhere. But this is one of those where um, I think you're going to have to wait and see. Because, um, like, next week, uh, they're on the Sunday, Monday, and uh, Wednesday, Thursday, the Flames do not play. Uh, so like there's, oh, you know, more of a time break in there for Markstrom to get a breather, even though he might play all of the six games remaining this month. Um, it's just necessity, and you know he's been I playing think you well. Keep and Ladar and Lucic out until you've until you've clinched. Yeah, like it's it's tough because you know you'd ideally want. Yeah, and I I would expect that um, like if the Flames do catch Winnipeg by the time that they play them on April fifth, that you might see Vladar play the Chicago game um, in advance on the fourth. But yeah, I think that's pretty much the first opportunity uh, that you would see Vladar in net is on the fourth. I could maybe see him against Vancouver next week, but we'll talk about next yeah, week when we get there. That's a possibility too. I'm. I don't know the Flames are going to do well against the non-good teams this this week, just based on the way things have gone in the past. So I'm going to predict they beat Vegas and they beat LA. Vegas, like you, worries me. I'm not. I'm not. My head says they lose to Vegas. My heart says they beat Vegas. And then they find ways to lose to Anaheim and San Jose, even if it's just getting one point. But I think that. I mean, Anaheim had their number, you know, two weeks ago, and I think San Jose is going to find a way to have their number as well. Yeah, and that could very well happen. It's just they need the points, so that's why I'm going four for four. They sure do need the points. Yeah, because until you're you're ahead of uh, Winnipeg with equal games played, you you gotta, uh, you know, it, it, you're behind. And so more and more that uh, there's two key games that are more and more looking like they're going to be keys in August, in April. The fifth against Winnipeg and the tenth against Nashville could be very important games for this team. Yeah. Well, like uh, looking ahead on uh, Winnipeg's schedule, like this week they have a fairly easy week: uh, Arizona, uh, Anaheim, and LA, and then they play San Jose as well. So, like their week is ahead is kind of similar to ours. Um, April is not kind to them though, but uh, yeah, it because like April's basically murderer's row for the Jets. But um, yeah, it, it's one of those where. Uh, like Calgary basically needs to win to keep pace because like Winnipeg should beat Arizona, they should beat Anaheim, they might not beat LA, but they could. So like Calgary needs to do their homework. 
The team I'm a little more worried about is Nashville just because the game's in hand. Uh, I'm not just due to the fact that, like, they're, the rest of their schedule is literally horrendous. Like, uh, they, they play Buffalo, who's been really good, back-to-back -back with Seattle, then Toronto, Boston, Pittsburgh to end the month. Then next month, they got Dallas, Vegas, Carolina, Winnipeg, us, uh, Minnesota, and Colorado. So it's like, uh, yeah, there's like maybe one easy game out of that. <laughs> so like it, it's, yeah, uh, I would expect uh, Nashville to kind of fall off their pace over the next bit because, you know, I hope so. like it, it, there are just too many elite teams that they're facing. Like it, it's not realistic for them that, you know like it, put it this way if they make the playoffs then i'll be congratulating them because damn you had a hell of a hard hurdle to overcome to get there because yeah, they really needed it yeah like you earned it if you get in but yeah i don't uh i don't see them realistically being able to hold everybody else off you could be right we'll find out how everything goes and i think for flames fans there's a lot of games between our team and other teams you're going to be paying attention to this week. Yeah, actually, um, while we're on that topic, I'm actually going to be cheering for Nashville later on in this week with their back-to-back -back against Seattle just because uh, the Kraken are not uh, in the best of spots either. And like their schedule's similarly like a murderer's row of good teams uh, to end the season, so... You know, it's possible that Seattle could fall off as well. So, we'll see. Um, Calgary just has to win their games, period, and go out and give it their all and get the two points. And the more they can do that, the better off they'll be. And let the chips fall where they may with everybody else. Like Daryl Sutter likes to say, the only thing that impresses them is wins. So, let's impress the old man and let's get some wins this week. Yep. And as always... Go Flames Go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.